My name is Michael Guyette, publisher of The Lead Lag Report. Joining me for the rough hour is Mr. Chris Fenton. Chris, I know you a bit, but for those who don't know who you are, as usual, introduce yourself. Who are you? What's your background? What have you done throughout your career? What are you doing currently? First of all, you had a great spaces earlier, so this is going to be a tough act to follow. But it's always an honor being on here. My background, I think, will allow me to be very relevant to most of your listeners. I mean, I fell into the US-China space. I was not a study in it or a PhD in Mandarin studies. I was more like Michael Keaton, say, in that old movie, Gung Ho, where he fell into sort of the world, the crazy world of culture and commerce with Japan when his factory was taken over by the Japanese. Well, my life started as a Cornell engineer coming out to the entertainment business. I got my first job in the wax on, wax off part of Hollywood, which is the mailroom at the William Morris Agency, which is currently today Endeavor. And I worked my way up there over about a decade and was an agent in the television and film business and then started my own boutique version of that and started producing movies as well as representing artists and whether they were writers, directors, actors, producers. And one of those producers, directors, and actually sources of financing for small independent films happened to be a company called Paysetter Productions out of Beijing. No one in the turn of the century, we're talking around 2000 to 2002, was even thinking of China. They knew the potential there. And, and in fact, in 1997, we saw Michael Eisner go over there to kiss the ring of Beijing in order to keep Disney moving towards a theme park, which eventually happened 20 years later. But no one was really interacting with that market all that much. And what was interesting is I started putting movies together with Chinese money, and I did a bunch of other things with this Chinese entity, including helping them represent Michael Phelps for the Olympics, Kobe Bryant for NBA and and the Chinese version of the NBA over there, and helping them sign various brand brands that we were the agency of record for. And over that time, they decided to buy my company. And then boom, I was full-blown Michael Keaton thrown into the crazy dragon versus eagle world of the US-China landscape at a time when China's market was on the rise in a exponential fashion and everybody wanted to be in there. Uh, cut to today, I, I talk about my time quite a bit doing that over the course of 20 years And I'm very constructively engaged on the idea that we need to reset and rebalance the relationship with that other superpower in a way where I sort of call myself on a dove to uh, hawk scale, probably a six. So I'm on the hawkish side of the scale. I believe there needs to be a lot of rebalancing and reciprocity between the two countries and the way we've been engaged with them over the past 20 years and past 40 years. But we also don't want a war with them. So that's essentially me in a nutshell. And I'm ready to take away any questions you got here, Michael. All right. So I want to use that, go on that term reset relationship, because that's a term that a lot of politicians use. And it sounds good, right? And it it makes sense. But let's set the stage for what that even means. What is a, a reset? And what is it that China has done that is the real core problem from a U.S. perspective? Well, from the... The U.S. perspective, we have a country that's run by one particular person, Xi Jinping, but also standing committee of several other individuals and then a party of about 92 million overseeing 1.4 billion people. Their biggest directive is to keep those 1.4 billion people just happy enough that they don't revolt. They want to keep their system intact. And the best way to do that is to keep their people relatively happy. And I say relatively happy because there's just not simply enough resources on earth to make them all happy. We would create a Swiss cheese of a globe if we did that. So they're trying to do two things. One is tangibly make their lives better. And then intangibly through information and the dissemination of aspiration and things that they are putting out there in sort of a soft power apparatus to make their population feel like if they work really hard, they can aspire and eventually achieve some of the things that they don't necessarily have. So they're providing all of what they need and some of what they want, and then this aspirational quality that they can provide even more if their public supports them and works hard. So one of the interesting facets of that is that they have massive scarcity issues, whether it's energy, resources, food, and water. 
So in order to implement that strategy, they need to reach out beyond their borders and essentially secure those resources that their energy pro- that they're deprived of. And that is where we hit some major obstacles. I mean, you see what they're doing in the South China Sea, in the Arctic, potentially in space, doing with some of our allies and some of our non-allies that we have some sort of relationships with, especially in Southeast Asia, in order to provide what their massive civilization needs and growing population, well, not growing in numbers, but growing needs of their population desires. And that's where we're hitting this conflict. And the second part where that all plays into is the fact that they have created this really imbalanced trade relationship with us. A lot of that is essentially determined by this idea that they want to catch up to the rest of the world, having sort of started about 40 years ago, their industrial revolution as quickly as possible. And that's where we see a lot of these issues in terms of process theft, theft, tech theft, different patent theft, IP theft, things that allow them to essentially take what we've spent centuries building and starting right there at the starting line and then moving forward from that and trying to become a world leader in various categories and various industries. And that's where we have to stop the reckless capitalism that we've embarked on and start to think about patriotism before capitalism. And I think that in a nutshell is sort of where we're at today. How do we reset a relationship with China if there isn't a fundamental trust between the two countries, right? I mean, you hit on it, right? Tech theft, and you're seeing all the actions being taken around semis and, you know, concerns around AI and all these technologies being exported to China and them copying it and getting an advantage over us. Even though if you look at some of the videos coming out of China, they seem to be way far more advanced on the AI side in terms of day-to-day implementation than anything we see here in the States. But it seems like we're getting further and further away from increasing trust between the two countries. The trust is low. I mean, they are, I, I, and I forget who coined the term, but I love the term, the strategic rival. I mean, I call them a non-allied nation. I like the term strategic rival. And in a way, they're essentially another sports team, your rival sports team. You know that you sort of need each other to play your A game. You need each other in order to draw the crowds and the money that comes in from those crowds and the TV rights and all that kind of stuff but you wanna beat them every time you're on the field. And quite frankly, you're never going to trust them with any sort of, hey, we'll share a play with you if you share a play with us. There's not that type of trust built under it. It's completely a competition, but one that believes in the fact that both sides sort of need each other and sort of need to somewhat cooperate in order to make that yin and yang work. So that's sort of where we are today. I mean, we do not want a kinetic conflict with them. I don't think we can decouple. And if we did decouple, that probably would lead to a kinetic conflict. So the world should be rooting for us to somehow figure out how to look at them as arch rivals, but also rivals that are somewhat needed for the balance of the globe moving forward. As that goes back to the mutually assured destruction, you don't want a kinetic conflict, obviously, in that sense. Uh, but maybe you, you can kind of get to the same place in a different way uh, by uh, ruining a generation's view of its own country, which gets into a discussion around TikTok and some of the stuff that you've put out. Um, I just saw the headline around, I think, the TikTok CEO saying, what, he's going to, they're going to dedicate $2 billion to protecting U.S. TikTok users and, you know, anybody that has followed TikTok is probably rolling their eyes around that. Talk about, and I know we've talked about this before, but I want you to get a little bit more in depth on this. Talk about the influence of TikTok as a China-owned entity and how it's impacting the culture of the U.S. versus the culture in China. Yeah, well, well, first of all, there, TikTok, there is a Chinese version of TikTok in China, but it's completely different. It's essentially used to teach science to kids or promote Chinese Communist Party narratives, things that the Communist Party believes is going to help people rally around the flag and support the government system and also possibly educate kids to become better model citizens. It is definitely not the TikTok that we have in the West. When you look at TikTok here, what's interesting is one of the biggest plays that you see from lobbyists or PR reps, et cetera, or even attorneys is that they're trying to distance TikTok from ByteDance in a lot of ways, and also ByteDance away from China and TikTok away from China's influence. 
One of the biggest issues with that is even if you move a headquarters outside of China, say you move a headquarters to Singapore, you will have expat Chinese working in those headquarters, or you'll have certain people directing whoever's working in those headquarters, certain agendas, certain missions, certain purposes. And a lot of that is going to be coming from internally in China, or it'll become coming from Chinese nationals that are working in those headquarters off China's shores. Now, the issue there is maybe they're not inside the PRC. Maybe they are free to help protect data or right? free to not throttle certain you know, important news that are under 30 year olds are digesting, or maybe they're feeling wrong and they don't want to amplify things that are dividing our country. But the issue is Beijing still has control over them and can tell them what to do. And the reason for that is, is all those Chinese nationals that are working in headquarters overseas have family, they have friends, they have certain things that are their responsibility, whether it's their health and safety, whether it's assets that they own in China, that Beijing has huge leverage over. And in a world where humans are human, we look out for our own self-interest and we look out for the protection of our family and friends, Beijing knows they always will have the upper hand. So you can put ByteDance, you can put TikTok wherever you want in the world. But as long as it's not completely bifurcated server-wise and who's involved with it and that there's nobody with any sort of tentacles inside of China, until that day happens, you're going to have this control of, over one of the most important sources of news and information for anybody under the age of 30 in this country, and that is the next generation of Americans. So if you look towards the election this year, the amount of politicians that are trying to reach that audience is massive. That's a huge part of their voter base. That voter base has lots of data that Beijing has access to. But then on top of it, Beijing has access to TikTok, which is sourcing the news and information that those 30-year-olds are digesting. So they can technically try to steer campaigns, steer elections towards certain outcomes, and also further divide our country over various individuals that might be simply really constructive for the leadership of this country. So that is where the big problem is with TikTok. I've never really thought of it this way, and I don't want to go too deep down the rabbit hole in this, but I mean, do you get a sense that maybe there's a, a cause and effect around TikTok and that younger generation and just in general, since you've mentioned uh, divisiveness, sort of wokeism and the pushback against wokeism? I mean, it seems like if the argument is that TikTok is creating a generation of people that are not proud of their country, which you can argue is basically what's happening, right? You can see that from another number of interesting surveys. That's like a purposeful move by China. It seems like that's sort of the, the way to do it. Yeah, I don't really know if Beijing particularly cares about left or right or woke or non-woke. I think what they care about is the art of war. And to divide your enemy is the best course of action to do that. If you could do that without actually kinetic conflict, well, it's game on, right? So they're just looking for any tinder, any you know sparks that they can amplify to further divide the country. And if you look at the woke versus anti-woke type of sentiment out there that's um, held dearly by one side of the aisle versus the other, they see a real opportunity there. So if you're looking at under 30-year-olds, they're out there pushing certain narratives that are further dividing the country. I mean, the Israeli conflict, obviously, we're seeing all parts of that come together in real time since October 7th. But we've seen that in terms of DEI and affirmative action and Supreme Court rulings and abortion and various other issues that a lot of people have very important points of view on. And quite frankly, there's a lot of issues where some people should just get to the point where they agree to disagree. But if you create these into life or death, either or scenarios where one is evil and one is good, and that's what China is doing a really good job at you create real problems. And by the way, I'm not taking off full responsibility from the American platforms either. I mean, let's face it, Facebook and Instagram and Snap and Twitter and all these different platforms have had issues. But the one, the one difference is, is that the nefarious behavior of a non-allied nation having control over those American platforms is not there. Whereas a non-allied nation that does have a rivalry with us does have that power and influence over TikTok. So there's 
there's trust among governments and then there's trust among corporations. I want you to talk about the business climate for U.S. companies trying to expand and grow within China and then the other way around. We'll get into the huge disparity of markets, but and I'm sure that relates to trust too. But are, are things improving at all there or are they deteriorating in the way that it seems like the stock divergence would suggest? Well, it's very mixed as far as what type of information you're getting out of there. I mean, keep in mind, Beijing controls information and narrative better than anyone. So you have very interesting platforms, say, whether it's Muddy Waters or Leland Miller and China Beige Book that have real access to real information. And they're trying to disseminate that around to investors so that we can make good decisions in terms of that market. But let's face it, no one really knows how bad it is. We can all speculate. And they do have the power and might of a major economy to potentially, in a best case scenario, do all the right things in order to fix some of their issues. But I would bet that they're going to hit a lot of hard times. And one of the things that I think is really interesting is that since we've started to distance ourselves, I guess, at least in a intangible way as far as a bipartisan consensus that we want to constructively balance and selectively reduce our dependence on China. It hasn't really gotten there in a big way, but because we mentally have gotten there, there's a lot of sentiment out there and a lot of talk about how China's ills aren't going to affect the rest of the world, or they certainly won't affect the United States of America. Whereas you go back as simply as just say two years ago, and for the pre-existing say 20 years prior to that, everybody would have said, well, if China coughs, the rest of the coal, the rest of the world catches a cold. So I'm really curious to see how that plays out and whether we're really that resilient and really that immune to what looks like is going to be a big downturn in that market. Now, in terms of business sentiment, in terms of business opportunities, I will say I am a constructive, practical, uh, missioned purpose when it comes to trade between the two relations. Or the two countries. And the reason for that is they built their industrial revolution on our backs, the same way we did on Europe's backs back in the 1800s. So I feel we have every right to get our products and services into that market and monetize it to the best way possible. But moving forward, like I said, we can't follow this reckless capitalism that we had for the pre-existing four years. We need to protect the principles and values that are important to Americans. And most importantly, protect national security interests. So in terms of where business businesses are going moving forward, there's a lot of headwinds. Number one is the country, that nation has turned inwards. And because it's turned inwards, the sentiment towards anything American or anything really from the West is no longer in that sort of brand of luxury product, right? It's now seen as, oh, that comes from them. Maybe I should look and see if I can replace it with something domestically, right? If you look in terms of, say, Nike, one of the great companies for the United States of America and one of the most profitable and successful companies ever to enter that market, they're suddenly having huge ha headwinds from competitors such as Anta and Li Ning. In fact, Li Ning and Anta now, I think, control at least about, as of about a year ago, some, something like 30 plus percent of that athletic market whereas Nike's around 22%. That's a very different ball game than it was, say, five years ago. And that uh, has a lot to do with sentiment towards products and services from the West, combined with the fact that, unfortunately, in order to get access to the market, we had to teach them how to fish, and now they're catching their own fish instead of buying our fish. And now that Nike and Adidas and various other Western brands have essentially shown design work, uh, factories, how you create the process and what kind of technology goes into their shoes. You have Chinese companies making model shoes that are at the same level as the competitors coming from the West. And we're seeing that rinse and repeated across multiple categories, across multiple industries. Probably the most high profile version of that, I would say, in today's world is probably what Elon Musk is facing with BYD and the EV market in terms of Tesla. Okay, I'll definitely get into that, but this point about the reckless capitalism of the last 40 years, I guess the question becomes, what do you do about that other than the blunt force dynamic of tariffs and fines, assuming you could even 
enforce the fines because all that has other implications on U.S. consumers, right? Particularly on the tariff side. Yeah, I think first of all, you got to you keep it simple, stupid in a lot of ways in terms of sort of this patriotism versus capitalism and putting the priority on patriotism. So a lot of supply chain issues that have national security interests involved with them, particularly, I mean, we saw them arise during the COVID pandemic. We had a lot of healthcare products, a lot of, you know, essentially antibiotics, different medicines that were manufactured inside China. And we realized, oh my God, we have a pandemic. We're suddenly reliant on our rival on the other side of the Pacific to get any of this stuff. So we need to be very careful about where we're sourcing materials to make these products and where these products are being made off our shores if they're not here on shore. So that's why you're hearing a lot of moves to say near shore allies or allies on the other side of the Pacific, say in Southeast Asia, to do some of this at a cost level that makes sense and doesn't create a massive amount of inflation. But with some of this stuff, we're going to have to move it onto our shores. And yes, that's going to create disruption in terms of the cost input to make those products, whether it's labor or whether it's you know getting through government regulations, et cetera, et cetera. But that's where we really need to put our emphasis is in terms of curing the reckless capitalism engagement with China, we need to always think about what's in the best interest and the long-term interest of the United States of America in terms of a product or service that we're trying to get into that market or that we're using that market for in terms of supp- uh, supply chain production. All right, so obviously it's an election year, right? And there's going to be all kinds of implications, whether it's, you know, looks like it's going to be Trump, but who knows, Trump or Biden. Where are we in terms of policy shifts or policy trends that would persist independent of who is in the White House? And how could things change if you end up having you know, Trump in there? Well, I would say if you were Rip Van Winkle in 2020 and you fell asleep and woke up today and you just simply looked at the policies on the books towards China, you might have thought that Trump won. Biden really didn't change too much. A lot of what Trump enacted is there. There's been even stiffer sort of restrictions and policy towards China since 2020. So the differences aren't that big. I think where, and I'm nonpartisan, and I'm not going to put any political slant into this, but if you look at just sort of the tangible differences between Biden or Trump in terms of China, The one thing I would say I like maybe more in terms of Trump and in regards to, say, being a CEO of a multinational is that Trump wears on his sleeve exactly what his policy is to an extent. It sort of is very black and white where he stands on a given day. Now, every day that could change, but at least you know where he stands And you know if maybe a tariff is coming down a road, a restriction is coming down a road, a new law might be passed, new hardcore, say, anti-China hawks come into very powerful positions, say, the USTR or the Department of Commerce, you get an idea of where they stand. Biden, on the other hand, I think has been very cloudy. It's hard to tell where that administration stands. I think it's caused a lot of confusion inside the Beltway where Congress, say, should stand on certain issues. I think it's caused a little bit of cloudiness with all the regulatory authorities in terms of how we deal with China. And I think multinationals are constantly sort of scratching their head going, okay, well, where is this going? What is it today? What do I need to be aware of in terms of my forward guidance? And I think That's the big difference. But if you look at the actual real differences between them and how each president has sort of changed the dynamic with the other side of the Pacific, it's been relatively stable. So so on that point about the multinationals and and businesses and sort of things largely not changing, whether it was Biden or not, as far as the current state of the way the U.S. treats China from a business perspective, are there opportunities for those that uh, are looking at China, even beyond just public markets and saying, you know what, this might be as bad as it gets. Now is the time to actually start finding ways of either building businesses in China or working closely with other companies in China. 
or uh, do you expect that things will uh, maybe deteriorate further? Well, mutually assured disruption and disruption <laughs> destruction is sort of the way I look at it. I believe China and the U.S. and hopefully everybody leading the two countries is well aware that if we go back to a frozen relationship like we had pre-1971, that is only going to lead to a Thucydides trap and probably a kinetic conflict, which none of us want. So engagement is going to occur, but that engagement is going to be very complicated. Now, first of all, Taiwan is a big issue. That's, for lack of a better word, that's a bit of a trump card in the pile where I could give you all kinds of thoughts on how this is going to move forward. But if Trump, if Taiwan is in fact in, invaded or as she likes to say, reunited with the homeland, that could change everything. But say that doesn't happen. There is a huge market there. There's 1.4 billion people. There's 650 million that have moved into a middle class. There's a big consumer class there. There's a real market for products and services. I would argue there's a big market for investment too. The problem with investing there is it's very hard to diligence investments. The numbers are very cloudy. A lot of times they're made up. And then even the best firms, the best advisory firms that would diligence those investments are now completely throttled or stifled from being able to give any honest opinion or assessment on investment assets. We've seen raids of everybody from Mintz Group to Bain to you know, issues with JP Morgan saying something is dangerous to, to invest in. People disappeared for saying that a particular investment is something that they would highly discourage getting involved in. So the diligence to invest there is very difficult. Now, on the same side of getting products and services in, the idea of access capitalism, for instance, this ability to know certain people inside the government and have guanxi is what they, what they call it. Guanxi is relationships combined with case study history, and that allows you access to the government, which gives you access to the market. That access capitalism arrangement that a lot of companies had through different firms is now very tarnished and a target of the regulators and lawmakers. No one's using access capitalism anymore. So now it comes down to, do you simply have a product and service that China wants? And are you able to do enough of what Beijing wants you to do while keeping true to American standards and principles and values and national security interests of the United States in order to placate Beijing enough to get access to that market. Now, the other thing you have to think about is even if you have access to that market, it's very hard to get expats working over there, watching process, watching quality control, watching costs, watching what Beijing is looking at or whether there's Communist Party officials coming into the office on a daily basis, the loyalty of non-expats there, the Chinese nationals, even though most of them are really good people, great humans, and people that I would consider close friends in a lot of cases, their self-interest is one of being, caref being careful of themselves and their families and friends. So if Beijing asks them for something or demands essentially something turned over to them. They're going to do it. So the loyalty to headquarters for a product and service manufacturer that's got access to that market is very limited. So you have to figure out how you put an infrastructure there that is strong enough to, to make sure that your product and service is kept at the quality level and the cost control level and the marketing abilities that will allow that product and service to thrive there. But at the same time, you need to be aware that there's a lot of risks that we weren't necessarily having to worry about, say, 10 years ago, or maybe we should have been worried about, but now we're actually very cognizant of. The other part of this, of course, is the environment to just do business in general when you've got, you know, clear deflation happening in China. And, you know, there was that news that broke around, you know, stabilization spending or whatever it was to try and alleviate the downward pressure of the Hang Seng. What's your sense of just on the ground, the, the likelihood of the economy reaccelerating there? Going back to your point about, you know, China really hasn't affected the U.S., I'd argue it depends on how their economy interacts with commodities because yeah, any kind of pressure downward or upward from China on commodities will obviously impact inflation from a cost push perspective. But where are we in terms of just the economy in China in general? 
Well, the economy in China in general is one that's probably, if the numbers are even close to correct, should still be a little bit to the envy of the rest of the world. I mean, they they did grow again at roughly five and a half percent. The question is whether that's a real number. And what, but, and one thing I will add is that the numbers, a lot of times that come out nationally on behalf of the PRC might not be as manipulated at the top as they are at the bottom. Keep in mind, growth has to continue at a regional, local, and municipal and provincial level in a lot of cases in order to service all the debt that these local governments have taken on in order to build infrastructure and develop real estate and various other things. So they have to sometimes really cook their books. And then Beijing sits there and analyzes and puts together the cum of all these numbers and then spits out essentially what they say their national number is. In a lot of cases, they probably do fudge it, but in a lot of cases, they're probably fudged from below. So even if it's not five and a half percent, say it's 4%, it's still a pretty good growth trajectory in terms of a country that's got 1.4 billion. So there's a lot of inertia there and a lot of momentum. The issue that I think is really nefarious and dangerous though is what is their debt load? What is the real amount of debt that needs to be debt serviced? And what is not being seen because it's held by the shadow banking system, which keep in mind is a banking system that was essentially put together to finance people and companies' ability to service debt. So a lot of that extra debt in the shadow banking system was taken out because, say, somebody could only pay a million of their two million in interest that they owed every month. So they took out a loan to service that extra million that they couldn't actually pay in interest payments. And if you look at that problem with the shadow banking system and compound that with the overall debt overhang that this growth is essentially created from, you might realize that the economy has a lot bigger issues than any of us could imagine. But I do think coming up with that theoretical and particularly could be realistic outcome is more about a when rather than an if. Yeah, it's really very, very complicated, I think. I mean, I've written about how China could, uh, even I still think it's Japan, could be a catalyst for a broader tail event, but it's been like a slow implosion, right? Everybody thinks that Evergrande ends up being a catalyst and nobody cares about it, right? Unless you're actually in China and, and involved with Evergrande. So it does make for some interesting scenario analysis. I saw that headline from Musk a few days ago. I think it was along the lines of uh, China's EVs will uh, demolish uh, rivals, demolish competitors. And that kind of goes to your point about doing business with China. Any insights on that? What, why, what kind of spooked Musk to say that? And what are the implications on the EV movement of China getting as involved as it is? You know, that's a really good question. In fact, I was talking to some people close to Alon asking, you know, what their thoughts were. Because I, one, one big marker to me that raised my antennas was the fact that Alon, in that tweet, or actually it was a quote, I guess, with CNBC, said that certain trade restrictions and regulations and various other things to protect the interests of Tesla and American manufacturers in the EV space need to be put, put into place. And when I saw that, my immediate thought was, oh, what's Beijing going to think about that statement? Because Elon has been very careful to not tread into areas that would be seen as sensitive or controversial to Beijing because he's got such a major supply chain dependence on China as well as. So I am curious to see what kind of fallout would happen with that. But the second thing is, and I don't know this for sure, but one of the things that Elon had when he entered that space is that he didn't move into the forced JV realm that every other multinational was forced into. He had a lot of leverage to bring his company into China, and he avoided being forced into JVs, avoided into having to hire high up engineers and various other individuals that could essentially be spies for his process or spies for his technology, et cetera, and essentially then share that with domestic competitors. 
What happened in the following years, though, is we saw a lot of headlines of fiery crashes of Tesla's on roads in China. And almost all those fiery crashes were really well documented via lots of closed circuit television cameras. Quite a coincidence, considering there's a lot of roadways that, yeah, they do have a camera or two out in the you know, out in the farmlands or whatever, but these all happened in heavily covered areas. And a lot of skeptics were wondering if those accidents then led to Elon having to turn over a lot of technology in terms of being able to review and investigate why those, quote, accidents occurred by Beijing. And we might be seeing the ramifications of whatever he was being forced to show in terms of what his competitors now have access to and might have now further perfected. The fact that TikTok is allowed in this country, yet we don't have a lot of social media presence at all in their market is quite ridiculous. And you can rinse and repeat that in various other categories and industries. So that's one issue. We, you know, I think in the rebalance and resetting of the relationship, we do need to look at reciprocity as one of the big issues that we need to correct. The second thing is, and one of the arguments that I make, because I'm from the movie business, from Hollywood, I'm a huge believer in free speech protections. When it comes to TikTok, a lot of proponents for TikTok being here in the US will use First Amendment and free speech protection as a reason that TikTok should be allowed in this country. And my argument is, well, I'm all for free speech. I'm all for First Amendment protection. But We don't apply that to broadcast networks. I mean, the FCC is pretty, pretty stern when it comes to any sort of foreign entities, non-allied foreign entities, having any invested interest in any of our broadcast networks, whether it's on television or on radio. And we should apply that same principle in terms of social media too, especially TikTok, which by itself dwarfs any sort of reach with under 35 year olds by radio or television. So we should apply just a simple same standard to what the FCC has already applied to in the broadcast network space. Now, once again, I'm nonpartisan in this issue, but I do think it's really interesting the way I think we banned RT from most carrying, most of its carry inside the United States, which is the Russian platform. And we've taken all kinds of, we've moved all kinds of restrictions on Russian, you know, influence here in the country. But on the China side of the equation, I think it's been very muddied by this idea that maybe it's Asian hate or it's, you know, China hate if you're being tough on China, which by the way, no one talks about being tough on Russia being about Russian hate. And I don't think the average person cares about thinking as the average Russian is their enemy. I think we believe Putin is somebody we don't like and we don't like Moscow. The same belief I have in terms of China. I have lots of friends in China. I love the country, quite frankly, but my issues are with Beijing and with Xi Jinping and the Chinese Communist Party. So to take a stand on something that Beijing has influence on, that Beijing has control of, should be something that is completely bipartisan. And one of the great things that has happened over the last year in Washington, D.C., is this bipartisan select committee on China that Mike Gallagher, from who chairs it from Wisconsin, a Republican, and his co-chair, Raja Krishnamurthy from Illinois, who's a Democrat, have put together. And they're really trying to approach the challenge, the threat, the rivalry that China poses on the United States from a bipartisan uh, consensus and a bipartisan effort. In fact, it was fully on display yesterday when they had Leon Panetta and Mike Pompeo as the two panelists of a hearing that they did on national security threats. You had Democrat and Republican there side by side talking about how if we're going to take on the chess plane titans of China or of Beijing's government in a way that allows us to win this competition, we need to do it as a fully united country. And that means both blue and red need to work together. Chris, talk about some of the um, initiatives that you yourself have been uh, doing. And I I think last time we chatted, you were uh, in in talks with different politicians and and getting involved in different uh, parts of the government. But 
What, what have you been doing on, on your end more recently? Yeah. So, I mean, professionally, I run a business called Fenton International Business Strategy and Communications. And what I focus on there as a business is helping multinationals deal with very difficult markets. I mean, China's definitely my forte, but I've played in the sandbox of Saudi Arabia and the Middle East and various other more allied nations. So it's really about trying to help their strategy, their strategic comms, their interaction with Washington, D.C. and those governments overseas and putting a good path forward and helping them grow in a very disruptive environment. In my non-money making endeavor, the place that I really like spending my time is working with that select committee on China that I brought up earlier. I think their effort is constructive. It's practical. Even though Gallagher is a, a devoted alum of our military force, he does not want war with China. He does not want to disengage with China. He believes there is a way for us to have our cake and eat it too. And Krishnamurthy on the Democrat side and his colleagues all believe the same. So even though the challenge of trying to essentially herd cats on, on, on Capitol Hill is very daunting, they're doing a good job of laying the ground and the foundation to get that done and to have a good, essentially consistent policy in terms of how we move forward with China moving forward. Chris, for those who want to track more of your thoughts, more of your work. Yeah, I mean, I to- try to keep everybody up to speed either on my LinkedIn or on Twitter, which is at the Dragon Feeder. I also have a website, which is Fenton dash uh, international. It's essentially a Fenton dash international business strategy and communications.com. And then I have a feeding the dragon book.com website too, where I'll put various thoughts and op-eds and so on that I have published up there. And if you ever want to pick up my book, um, it's a really fun sort of Michael Lewis business memoir look at the craziness that I had to deal with for 20 years working between the US and China. And it also paints a really sort of realistic depiction of how a lot of us were under this mission of pushing for the engagement between the two superpowers in order to spread aspirational quality of democracy in that market, to build GDP here, to create jobs, et cetera, et cetera. So we all had this interesting purpose that was a higher calling And to combine that with a really sort of lucrative way to have a career, it made a lot of sense to us. But most of us over time have realized we need to rebalance, we need to reset, and we need to further discussions on how we're going to do that right in a very constructive way. So I appreciate anybody that wants to follow me. I'll try to make sure my thoughts are as constructive as possible. I don't like to throw daggers or red meat around. I'm more about trying to make sure that the world is a better place for my two 17-year-olds. Everybody, please give Chris a follow, and hopefully I'll see you all later in the week. I've got a few more spaces lined up. Thank you, Thank you, Michael. Thank you, everyone, for listening. Take care. Cheers, everybody.